Um, we have Loami Richardson with us today. So I'll just say that before we pray, and then we're going to bring him on. And he's going to share his powerful testimony that I've only heard bits and pieces. I've never heard the whole thing. So we're all going to enjoy this together today. So please bow your heads with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, again, just want to thank you uh, for this Sabbath and just the blessing that Sabbath, this blessing and rest that Sabbath brings, Lord. I know that I was so thankful for this Sabbath, and I just, um, again, I'm just so thankful for the rest, and I know so many others are as well. Lord, be with us during this church service and during this testimony time as Lawami shares his testimony with us, just praying that it will bless others and encourage all of us uh, to just trust you and have a closer walk with you and always believe that you are working in our lives no matter what. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I want to welcome Lo Ami to, um, and he's no stranger, right? He's preached here. He is um, a member of Living Manna Church. And what some of you may not know is he is the young adult pastor of Living Manna Church. And he will be formally introduced to you uh, guys very shortly as that, but he's also, and he's also the host of The Struggle is Real. So we are just happy to have Lo Ami with us today. All right, welcome. What is going on? So that I can, can you see me? You. Can you hear me? As I was praying, no, I will be able to hear you. As, as I was praying, it fell right out of my ear. All right, okay. All right, and all right, Lamami, welcome. Well, and thank you for have, having me. Oh, awesome. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. All right, so you can hear me. All right. I can't hear you. No echo. You can or you no cannot? No echo. I can hear you. Thumbs no up. Echo, I hear you good. But you can hear no me. Echo. All right. Okay, yes. great. All right. Yeah, no, great to be back. It's always a privilege being able to uh, serve for uh, the Living Mana community. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. I know uh, I've done a lot for Living Mana, but I've never been able to like fully share my testimony. So I'm really excited about the Sabbath School today. So thank you for uh, yes. welcoming yes. me and uh, being a part of this uh, Sabbath School program. Yes, yes, I'm excited, very excited, because uh, I have never fully heard your whole testimony, and I want to. I'm excited to hear it today. And help me out. When? How many years have I known you? <laughs> Two thousand and nine was around the time that my conversion happened. So ASI Youth for okay. Jesus. Yeah. So yes. like after yeah, GYC, I Youth for Jesus. I just ASI mm -hmm. Youth for Jesus. Yeah. So it was around 2009, yes. 2010 around that time frame. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I know if we're not right, I know our, my, our son Joshua will correct us because he is <laughs> He'll a give him the date and time for sure. Date and time. Yeah. And you were the Bible worker for, uh, for uh, the youth for Jesus and our older children, um, they were, they were your uh, students. <laughs> so that's how I, yeah, my Bible, my Bible you. workers. Yes, yes. So that is the first time I, I remember hearing about you. So yes, just to let our audience know just a little bit more about you. Okay, so Loami Richardson is familiar with the struggles and challenges facing students today between the ages of 15 and 25. He was trapped in a lifestyle of fighting skipping school and selling drugs, leading to multiple juvenile, juvenile arrest. Uh, this behavior led to bad decision making, low academic performance, and wasted opportunities. His life took a positive, I'm so sorry here, took a positive turn when he attended a youth conference in Kentucky. Since that conference, he has traveled the world sharing his ins inspiring story detailed in his book i am i am i am is greater than i was from identity from identity to i'm sorry lost to per, lost to purpose let's say from identity lost to purpose found i am so sorry call it the the older people vision thing but okay all right we got through that <laughs> So glad we got through that. Okay, because the font was so tiny, and I tried to blow it up, and then I couldn't see. But okay, we got through it. But wow, that is that is powerful. That is powerful. So many. We're going to hear about that many juvenile 
uh, situations and, and where God has brought you from. And of course, Joshua would correct us. It was, he's specific, all right, here it goes. We met you, or you were introduced to our family from July to August 2011. So we were off by a couple of years. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, two years. All right, Josh, shout out. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yes, so right. it's, been, it's been good to know you. You've become a very good friend, and you are a great, amazing uh, member of Living Matter Church and support this, and we are very thankful for all that you do here. All right, so with that said, take us back. Tell us, you know, where it all began, where, the, where you learned that the struggle is real. Yeah, so it all started, I kind of grew up as a typical Adventist, grew up in an Adventist home. Uh, I had older parents, so my mother was in her late 40s and my dad was in his early 60s when they had me. So, um, so yeah, I was, uh, wasn't expected to, you know, I was kind of a surprise to both of my family, uh, <laughs> to both of my parents. I would um, so I always kind of grew up with older influence and older um, uh yeah, with older family, right? Family relatives. So I was always the youngest in the family. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, they both both of my parents were Adventists. We grew up in, in the church. I, I tell people all the time that I, I was the embodiment of a church boy, right? So for Monday through Friday, I went to church school. Uh, sa uh, uh, Saturday, if you ever attended a black church, it's not just church service, it's a church event. And so you go to Sabbath school, nine o'clock, and then 11 o'clock service. And then after 11 o'clock service, you have your potluck. And after potluck, you have your choir rehearsal. And then you have your AY. And after AY, you have your social. And then Sunday, I had Pathfinders. So I, I was someone who grew up in the church and grew up understanding what it was to have family devotions and uh, family time and things like that. Um, but I always tell people just because you grow up in the church does not mean that you have a relationship with God. And as much as I appreciate the influence and and the memories that i had growing up as a ch church you know as a as a young person in the church and having that experience of my mother teaching me the the principles of what it meant to have a, a godly relationship my dad teaching me what it meant to like be service minded and and you know um looking out for other people uh those principles always uh kind of set the foundation for me as a young man but as as i got i grew older right um uh, I, I kind of decided to uh, find my own path and find my own way. And a lot of my testimony um, really, if it can boil down to it, is who am I, right? What is my identity? Who, when it's all said and done, you know, what defines me? Um, my mother was Puerto Rican. My father was Black. So I grew up in a biracial home, uh, two different cultures. Uh, so you can imagine attending an all-Black church and being the light-skinned Puerto Rican boy, right? Where, oh, I'm black. No, you're not, you're Hispanic. Uh, I go to the Hispanic side, uh, you're not Hispanic, you're black. And it was always this, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. this, this trying to find out who I really was, where I fit in. And even theologically, from a church perspective, you know, my mother was uh, someone who loved present truth and the deeper meanings of the Bible and Bible prophecy. And my dad was more service oriented, right? So one was emphasized more than the other right and so i was always constantly battling um understanding okay how do i make sense of all of this uh so my my, uh, my experience as a, as a young person growing up in the church was always one of constantly analyzing and trying to figure out how this makes sense for me and it wasn't until i got much older in my conversion and, and i'll share a little bit about that uh here in a bit but it was un it wasn't until then that it all made sense and all made real it, it it was real to me the the experience that I needed to have with God to really know who I was and my purpose and my identity. I you know what you just shared and I you know and being raised Adventist as well myself and just you know working with so many young adults that are been raised in the Adventist church. I think if you what you just shared people will be like yeah that's my exact same story i would say that it's if it's the majority of young people who grow up um not just in the seventh day adventist church but just in any church period like when your christian parents try to raise you in their belief system that they have chosen for themselves at some like you have 
I mean, yours was, you know, a little bit different. You had the um, different cultures uh, that played into it as well. But just um, being raised by Christian parents and then being raised by Adventist parents, you have to at some point decide, like, okay, what is all of this? Do I want to do this for myself? And it's like for the longest time you're just kind to moving through the system because that's what your family and parents want you to do. But at some point you have to figure it out for yourself. Yeah. And, and so that was for me around the age of 16. That's usually the big uh, the time that you get your driver's license and you can kind of explore. So it wasn't until about 16, 17 years old that um, I started going to my friend's church. Right. I um, and uh, church service ended at 12. And all of a sudden I have all this free time and, you know, you stay at home and, you know, it's like, OK, um, any, any, anything in the afternoon? They're like, nope, that's it. Church is done at 12. And so, you know, it, it starts with these little small compromises <laughs> where I come home from, from church and I take a nap I mean, and now I keep the turn on the TV. At your friend's church, you could actually keep yeah, the ahead. Sabbath, like after church. You, you could, I was just going to say, at your friend's church, you could actually keep the Sabbath and go take a walk in nature or something. and Or maybe go, just, yeah, just, just have communion with God just by yourself. You're not programmed out all day from like program to program to program to program. Wow. Yeah, that was it. So, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, going, growing up in a black Caribbean church, it was jam packed with, with programs where I started attending my, my friend's church and we're off by 12. We go home, take a nap. They go for walks, et cetera. But it all started with like these little small compromises. Um, you know, I go home, take a nap, you wake up and uh, you turn on, you know, uh, the, the Christian station. And then all of a sudden you're scrolling through the channels and, oh, there's cartoons. Oh, there's sports. There's all of these things that, you know, everybody was watching. And it's just those little small things that I was doing, right, where I'm just like, oh, I started watching TV um, and, and watching things that I knew I, sh I should have watched, right? And then it kind of as I got older, turned 18, right? That's kind of the 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 time frame where it's like, hey, you can't tell you, you can't tell me to go to church or not go to church. Um, right. That's where I started my journey of exploring. So just so, to give a little context, so during that time frame, I always went to an Adventist Academy. And around the age, um, man, there's let me, I gotta backtrack even more. I kind of jumped up, jumped a little bit. So kind of talk a little bit about the family dynamics. Um, my mother and my father both separated when I was around um, in, in middle school. Uh, my mother, we owned a home in Puerto Rico and I was staying with my father in Florida at the time. And um, it was around that time frame when my mother, now that I know, looking back, she was dealing with a lot of mental health issues, um, a lot of uh, moments of depression and things of that sort. And so she went back to Puerto Rico. So at 12 years old, 12, 13 years old, right? You don't understand the full picture of what's happening. All you know is right. mom left, right? Yeah, um, mom, mom went to Puerto Rico. I need mom. Um, the emotional support is gone. And my father wasn't somebody who was very expressive emotionally. He was more of a, hey, I love you. I gave you $20. What, what else do you need from me? I, I provide a roof over your head, that type of mentality. And yeah. even my dad um, was working part time. And so a lot of my, the, from the time that I was 12 to about 14, 15 years old, I was by myself a lot of times, right? Mom was in Puerto Rico. Dad worked overnight. I was in school. So when I come home from school, my dad was sleeping. By the time I went to bed, he went to work, et cetera. So it was around that time frame. That's why I said around 16 years old, 17 years old, as I'm going to church, right? I'm experiencing uh, different churches coming home and these small little compromises took place. Um, that time frame was so vital because I didn't really have any adult uh, supervision per se. They, they wasn't there right. really guiding me because guidance. there was nobody there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so yeah, that, that, that a, played a vital a role. Time. I, I mean, I can just imagine that's a very difficult time. I mean, mom just leaves and granted after, you know, you realize now that there were some mental health issues, but again, at your age, you that doesn't compute to you. I mean, all it is, like you said, mom is gone and uh, that's a wound. That's a, that's 
pretty traumatic. Um, and dad did the best that he could, but emotionally was not um, as available as you needed him to be. Sounds It sounds like that uh, was the situation. That, um, did you have- That's why I was excited to, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. There's a slight delay, so if you I'm go, cutting off, it's it's because of that delay. No, but I, yes. I that's why I was excited about sharing my testimony because of that angle that you're sharing. That is not just mm -hmm. do's and don'ts in my experience. Is these things that mm -hmm. okay? There was an abandonment issue there. Okay, there's this unemotional attachment that's there. That really and and and, and at the same time trying to find out who I really am and how you know who I am. You know, like like who right. am I as a, a person, as an individual? What are my own thoughts? What are my own uh, what's my own worldview? How do I process these things? And no one ever asked, Lomi, how do you feel about this? It was, well, mom was sick. Okay, well, mom was sick. Nobody ever asked, Lomi, how do you feel about this thing? Um, right. And so that really, affect, you fast forward and then you realize, okay, I realized the certain decisions that I was making was all rooted from this experience oh, yeah. of my mother leaving at that time and my father not being you know, as much as he was a great support and I appreciated him, it wasn't there emotionally. Then you peel back that onion, then you realize, oh, the reason they were that this way is because of their own traumatic experiences. And so I, that's why I was like, I know Atante is going to bring out these little things that I usually don't well, able to share because it's not just, well, you I, know, I, it, it's it's a lot more to the story. You know what? You brought it out, but I do feel <laughs> as a therapist, I can tell you've done some work and you've got some healing. That's great um, perspective. That's a healthy perspective. Exactly what you said is a healthy perspective that um, any therapist would, would want you to see. And you're, you're seeing that. So that's, that's a you're right. Like meaning it, because where that puts you is in a space of forgiveness towards mm -hmm. Dad or and mom, meaning like, uh, of course, your mom had mental health issues and the choice she made, she just felt like she had to do that, but it did definitely traumatize and hurt you. And then dad not being emotionally available, of course, you could be, um, people stay, especially people stay bitter and angry and mad at a parent for that reason, and it causes so much destruction in their life. Um, but that doesn't take them to a healthy space. But what you just said, and and forgiving them and knowing that okay they did that because of the their past and the issues that they went through when we use that lens to view people who have either made a bad decision that has hurt us it helps to heal us and that perspective perspective helps us in our emotional issues and so yeah very healthy and good <laughs> what you just shared. well praise god you know that the work that i've been putting in has uh it, it's <laughs> showing right and it's revealing itself but even in the context <laughs> of the gospel when jesus is on the cross and he said father forgive them for they know not what they do like my parents did not know what they were doing and how it was going to affect me long term so that's where i found freedom in knowing i have to they, this is the best that they knew and i appreciate the efforts that they had but now it's up to me to take the the whole you know the 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 pieces that was broken and finding help to to make me complete and whole, not only in Christ, but his his desire for me to be whole. And so, you know, so during that time frame, mom is in Puerto Rico. My father, you know, he he's kind of distant in, in that sense. And at that point, mm -hmm. I've already made enough compromises where, you know, 16, 17 years old, I'm going to nightclubs, teen clubs. Right. I'm, I'm going out. You know, I remember uh, taking my father's car. Uh, I didn't have a license, but my next door neighbor, he had a, a permit and we'll drive around town, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> illegally uh, driving our vehicle and just kind of exploring the city and, and getting out the house. And, um, you know, so it, it was during that time frame where even I was becoming a handful for my father. Um, they would deem me as rebellious or not listening or paying attention. And um, and so I remember vividly where it, we'll go visit Puerto Rico during the summer, go visit my mother. And um, I was scooping around. Um, uh, I was doing something. I forget. But I, I remember opening the drawer and I saw plane, plane tickets. So I looked at the plane tickets and I saw a two way you know, round trip ticket for my father and a one way ticket for me. And so I asked my dad, I was like, hey, dad, what's what's up with the with the tickets? I only see that I have one and. And you have two. He's like, oh, well, you have the whole summer. Just call me when 
you know, I'll buy your ticket whenever, you know, you're ready to come back home. I'm like, all right, cool. So we went to Puerto Rico. This is around uh, middle school. Um, it had to be around okay. seventh grade, seventh, eighth grade. And um, so I went to go visit. My dad flew, flies back and it's coming closer to the school year. And um, my, my heart was to go to Forest Lake Academy, which is an academy down in Florida. And uh, all of my friends was going to go. And all of a sudden, I get a call from my dad, and I'm like, "Hey, dad, you know, school's about to start. Got to register." And he told me, "Like, you're not, you're not coming, you're not coming back home." And I was like, "What, what do you mean I'm not coming back home?" He said, "Yeah, no, I can't deal with you. Like, like you, your mother and I, we discussed this, and you're going to be staying with her." Now, Atante, you got to understand that there, there has been no like me growing up. There wasn't this. There was moments of seeing my mom and dad like in a good place but there was a, a lot of arguing happening right so right. when i talked to my mother about this situation she said well i think it is good for you to stay with me i'm like good for me to stay i don't know anything about puerto rico this is a culture shock for me i don't know how to speak spanish you know and i feel betrayed I was, i'm 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 stuck i was gonna ask you that because i think because you said that your mom was from you're half puerto rican um, there's been like uh, a lot of comments that are in Spanish, and I was going to ask you if you could, if if you could read them. There's a lot of people. There's some. There's some. Po there's some posts in the chat that are in Spanish. I was going to ask you, how is your Spanish? Um, I, I tell people lo entiendo mejor que lo hablo, so I can understand it very good. I can start speaking Spanish, and then it goes from Spanish to Spanglish to mannerisms, and then just English at that point. So everybody who tells me I speak Spanish, I speak it well. I'm just not confident in my Spanish. So that that's where I'm at. I, I understand I, it. You can talk right. to me. I'll understand. Right. I just don't expect me to okay. have a full blown conversation. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't see what the so, comments were, but I was like, hmm, well, maybe the mommy can understand that. Okay. So <laughs> that's <laughs> that's hard. I mean, dad deceived you when you were when you saw the two tickets he made it made you seem that it wasn't what it was and and that's unfortunate so when you found out that was definitely shocking and then you're right you went to another country i mean i'm sorry puerto rico is in america <laughs> it's american um territory so but you went to another place with a different culture and um and they speak mm -hmm. a different language so that had to have been very challenging and you're leaving all your friends and what you know that's traumatizing all here. of that right and then absolutely so even later on i think during the week right i'm i'm upset i'm angry so a lot of the behavior that stem came from this anger um mm. but it was always deemed as rebellion you're not listening you're not paying attention right, right? so mm -hmm. so i remember overhearing a conversation and it was some sort of social security check and whoever has me has the check and i was like oh uh i'm i'm just a check i am money that's that's what i oh. that is what my value is right um um so so overhearing that i addressed my mother and my mother was somebody and i, I want to say this like my mother if it wasn't for my mother's diligence and prayer and sacrifice i don't think i'll be standing here before you like mm -hmm. as as someone who loves god but there were some holes in in even her experience and i'm and, and i try to be there, there's a fine line between being respectful for what your family has done and being truthful and owning that truth. And I'm sharing this right. because I want young people or young adults to understand that no family is perfect, right? That, but right. God has given us the family that he has given us to, to guide us, to help us. And so my mother and my father did the best they could, but this was the reality. And it's in my book as well. So this is not something that I'm like, first time ever hearing I, I wrote this in this in, in my book as well and i'll share as to why i wrote my book but but that's how i felt as a 14 15 year old boy 14 years old um I'm just like wow check. i oh. i am i am just a check i am angry but i don't know how to channel that anger and so that's where right. you know as i now living in this new experience in puerto rico that's where i started Go, there was an actual bar right next to our house in 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 the in Morovis, and uh, that's where I used to go play pool and hang out with the locals, and that's where I got introduced to drinking and you know smoking and you know you start meeting the people in town and you just 
hey, I, I really have no friends here. I really don't have a community here. These are the people I hang out with. And so at 15 years old, this right. is when you start drinking. This is where, hey, they smoke, I smoke. Cool. You know, uh, I remember participating in car robberies and, and you know, all of these things as a teenager, you're not realizing the, the, um, the, 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 the you're you're not understanding the consequences of the decisions you're making you're just doing it because it's like hey this is all i have so i did go to a, an academy an adventist academy and basketball was always my outlet so um you know i kind of joke around before stephen curry was there was loami right and so I, that's why i'm a big fan of stephen curry and uh, i know you was gonna smile when i said that right uh because <laughs> i was a jump shooter i i i wasn't the I, I say this, right? Okay. So I, I have to add this little caveat. So it, it was somebody who I was never the fastest, the biggest, but I could shoot. And so seeing okay. like, you know, Curry, like, oh, you as a jump shooter, you can never succeed, right? You have to give the big man the ball. So when I see this little guy tearing up the oh. league just with jump shots, I'm like, by curiously he living through him all it. See, it was just a yeah. matter of time. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's proved that so, to be completely wrong. So Puerto Rico right so in puerto rico that was my that's where i found the thing like regardless if they could understand what i'm saying um regardless of the the rebellious behavior that i was demonstrating basketball was the thing right that mm -hmm. loami is good at basketball right and my that was kind of the the start of like i wanted to pursue a semi-professional uh, career in puerto rico i wanted to like play for puerto rico um because basketball there gave me an opportunity that I wasn't getting in the States. Right. So I took that as a opportunity to say, okay, let me, let me try to make the best out of the situation. And basketball was my safe haven during that time. And I, and I always appreciated my mother encouraging me to fulfill my dreams and, and make sure that God is the center in every decision making that if this is the career that I'm going to choose, make sure that God is glorified. Right. And so she always implanted those seeds, but there was still this thing there that at some point my mom didn't even know what to do with me anymore. Right. I, 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 I <laughs> there was a famous line by one of my favorite rappers growing up that just said, even when I was wrong, I, 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 I made sure that I had the last word. I always made sure that I was going to get my point across, even if, I, even if I was wrong. So even in, in school, when I was in Puerto Rico, it was just this always these situations where, people will share a lot more information that I cared to know. And so I just always took that information and said, oh, okay, cool. So I, I'll never forget there was this one time I've asked for forgiveness and God has forgiven me, but it was this one time in my math class where, and I was a disruptor, I was a jokester, I, I get it. But in this particular yeah. situation, I was not the cause of the problem. And um, so the teacher was writing something on the board and, um, one of my friends made a joke and we all laughed. And so the teacher was sitting there and she said, Loami, I need to stop disrupting the class. She never turned around. And I said, it wasn't me. And then she proceeded to say, it's always you. I'm like, oh, cool. She continues. I kind of let it go. It happens again. Loami, next time you disrupt the class, we're going to send you and you know what I'm saying? I'm going to send you to the principal's office. I was like, well, yo, I, it wasn't me. And even at that point, one of the um, one of the better students in the class spoke up and said, hey, it wasn't Loami. And he's like, well, you know, well, he needs to stop disrupting, et cetera, et cetera. And it was at that point where I felt the the need to remind her of who she was. And there was apparently she went through a divorce and all this other stuff. And I just started sharing. Okay. I was like, hey, don't get mad at me because you're angry. The fact that your husband left you and this is the job that you have left. Oh, and I wow. just went on and on and on and on and on and on. And I'll never forget that she turns around. She says, everyone close your books, you to the principal's office. And she went there and she said, either he gets kicked out or I quit. And I think that was the first time that I ever understood the power of words and the power of impact. That I was right, just like, you're right. willing to quit your job because of one little thing I said. And um, that that's what that's all I had was, you know, they, the Bible tells us that the, the life and death is in the tongue. So because of this thing that I had, I knew that you're tearing me down. So I'm going to tear you down. The only way that I know how is with my words and with the information that people entrusted me with. And um, at the end of the day, you may kick me out, but 
I have the last word and everyone's going to know who you, who you really are. And that's, those are the moments where I felt my mom came in and she was such a intercessor for me and, and, and understanding where she'll come in as a lawyer and present her case and bring her LNG white books and Bible verses and, and advocated for me and understanding, but, you know, and, and, and causing my teachers and, 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 and those people at the school to say, man, your mother is a very godly woman. And if it wasn't for her, we would have given you this punishment, but we're going to just suspend you for three days or whatever. So the, the, the outcome was always, um, less severe because of my mother's, um, love and faith and her, de her desire to see the best in me, but it did not negate right. the fact that there was hurt there. There was pain there. And so right. even during that time, it got to the point where my parents, my mother, and my sister specifically wanted to send me to a boot camp. And if you guys ever remember watching Maury Povich, mm -hmm. where, you know, they'll bring a drill sergeant and I'm like, you know, you're going to go to jail. And, and, and it, they try to scare these right. students straight. And, um, right. I was like, you know what? I ain't going to no boot camp. <laughs> I ain't going to no boot camp. So let me at least mm -hmm. straighten up my action. My, let me, let me conform. Let me modify my behavior so that way I do not get in trouble or end up going to, right. to a boot camp. And um, I'll transition into this last part and then I'll, I'll leave you to, to ask any questions. It was at that point where that decision for me to move back home to Florida was made. And I'll never forget my mom took me and, and she um, you know went to buy all these new school clothes. And uh, that Friday night, I went to the bar, we started drinking and I drank until I blacked out. And those same friends brought me to my house. And I remember slumped over wearing my the brand new clothes. And my mother was sitting there and I threw up like in front of her, in front of, you know, mm -hmm. and I just remember the pain that my mom was experiencing at that point. And, um, you know, when I, I try to correlate a lot of these things to the, to, to the message of the gospel where here it is that Christ gives us a newness, a, a new righteousness, right? A, a new robe to wear. Right. And, and we, because we have not the, we have not done the internal work, we vomit our old stuff out and, and we constantly mess up the, the, the new clothing that God wants to put upon us. And so I'll never forget the look on my mother's face um, where, you know, she felt hurt by that decision and, and, and it, and it, it pained me where I said, you know, I, I want to do better. I just don't know how to, I, I just don't know what to do with this thing that I'm experiencing. But that was kind of my, my time frame in Puerto Rico where I was leaving that place knowing I wasn't really changed. I just, I, I just did enough to get out of that situation. Um, but I, I, I know that I broke my mom's heart with right, that decision right. that I was making and, and you know, and I want to use this as a teaching moment um, because so many times as parents, and we, and you know we're we, it's, look, it's raising kids, guys. Between being married, to be happily married, and raising kids are probably the two hardest things to do in the world, right? Raising children, it 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 just it's difficult. So no shade on parents. I'm a parent of four, so I know the challenges. Um, that you face, but when, and this, I'm speaking to parents now, when you have a, if you have a child that is going through or doing, having some of the behaviors similar to what Loami just um, described, and especially as Christians, instead of getting mad and instead of getting angry with them, realize, because what Loami needed right then, Loami, what you needed then, that is when you needed a therapist or someone to help and talk to you for, for what you, because you were going through so much then the hatred, the resentment um, that you had going on. It just, that's what led you to do those things. And so when our children act out, there's a reason for that. And so to be very mindful, and again, this is to, to parents, is to, um, is to seriously think about and consider getting them the help that they need, where they can just be in their own safe space and talk to somebody. Um, I know that as Christians, we, 
I mean, now getting mental health help for our children is more popular than it used to be, for sure, but it's just starting to turn that corner. And so, so many times we have like these, we just be like, oh, they're just rebellious or they're just uh, disrespectful and they're just bad. Well, maybe their behavior is bad. It is bad, but why? Why? And to find that out and to get them mm -hmm. the help that they need. So I'm just encouraging all parents there. And so now mom sent you back to dad. <laughs> So she, yeah, she was too yeah. much. So you, you it were was too much for her to handle in Puerto Rico. Right. And you know, she was struggling financially and all of those things. And she always made sacrifices to put me in the best situation, whether it be church, you know, going to a private school. So I've always um applaud my mother for making that sacrifice. A lot of people uh talk it, she lived it, right? Like even if she had to mm -hmm. pour out her last little bit of money to make sure that I it, it right. gave me an opportunity to know God, she was going to do that. Um, and and one thing that as he was talking, I, I remember the one time there was a police officer that um, when they called, you know, it's a small town. So there was always the same police officer that will come if there was some situation at the home. And I'll never forget the police officer didn't. He said, hey, let's go. Let's go next door and play pool. And, you know, we're playing pool and he's talking to me and asking. He knew a little bit of English. So I just felt comfortable enough to like open up. And he was like, wow, I did it. it. All I needed was just somebody to listen, not even to say that I was, I just needed somebody to understand what I was going through. And, and so I, I'll never forget uh, that police officer taking the time to really hear me out. And then being right. that person, that advocate to my mother was like, yeah, your son is, we, we talked about these things, but um, he's not a bad kid, right? He's, he's just, He's hurt, you know, whatever, whatever. And I don't think she probably fully understood during that time what, what he was communicating. But here I am, I'm going back to, to Florida and um, I'm excited. I It was about two and a half years, three years that I lived in Puerto Rico. And so when I moved back to Florida, you know, I have a full accent now, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm finally going to the school that I wanted to go to, uh, the, the private school of Forest Lake Academy, because all my friends were there. And my goal was to be one of the most popular kid in school and i was going to play basketball that was it there was nothing else in between nothing about school nothing about academics that was the two things i right. wanted to pursue and so um so as i'm meeting the friends right um <laughs> i i set out to do that i i skipped class i didn't really care to uh study but i wanted to play basketball but then when I had the opportunity to make the team, I couldn't because my GPA wasn't reflective of that. And um, mm -hmm. and in that situation, I got into a fight. Um, it was a full out brawl there at the school and I was in the middle of it. Mm. And um, as they brought me into the office, the young man that I was getting in an altercation with said something. And as I responded, it just so happened that the principal and I believe the conference president at the time was there for visitations. And I'm yelling, I'm cursing, I'm doing whatever. Oh, and uh, the principal, wow. you know, told me, Loami, to the principal's office. And I turned around and I said, I'm not going to, you know, fill in the blank office. And I remember the president saying, well, how are you going to handle this situation? And so they made an example out of Loami that, that semester. And so I only lasted one semester oh. at Forest Lake Academy. Uh, because of my GPA. So I got kicked out of Forest Lake with a 0.68 GPA, like less than a 1.0 mm. GPA. And it was at that time where my reputation, I was somebody who always pushed the boundaries. Um, I was rebellious back then, and, and there's some sort of rebellion even in me now, but good rebellion, not bad rebellion. Um, but trouble, even then, trouble. it was like, all right, let's, good trouble. I like that, good trouble. <laughs> but they would, you know, here I was in this judgment seat and there was all of these teachers and administrators making a decision about what's going to happen for, uh, to me. And they opened up the books, right? And they laid out all of the reasons why I should be kicked out of school. And I'll never forget, shout out to uh, Gail Murphy. Mama Murphy was the only person wow. who advocated for me. Yeah. And she, because she wow. was like, listen, I understand what he's saying, but he's the one who comes to choir. He's always attentive. You know, I only went to choir because we got Disney tickets at the end of the semester and I used to flip them things and sell them. But Mama Murphy, we respected her. And and it was because she took the time to care and talk that I was like, yo, I don't want to disappoint her. So I'm going to I'm going to put on my best behavior for her. But she was uh, 
she was the one person who advocated for me. Fast forward uh, years later, I got to preach at a church and she was actually the uh, music, uh, the pianist for the day. So it was super yeah. cool to be able to preach and that she she's, plays the music amazing. to make an appeal. She is awesome. Oh, Mama Murphy. So she I is the that. one person who had advocated. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it was at that point that I got kicked out of Forest Lake Academy and I was now transitioning to go to public school. And where I thought I was going to go, I was zoned for, and I ended up going to a Title I school, you know, high dropout rates in the middle of the, you know, of, of, of the hood. And at, for the mm -hmm. first time in my life, I am now outside of this bubble, right? I am outside right. of this. For the most part, you know, you grow up at Adventist, you're the coolest kid on the block because you, you know, you do this or you do that, whatever. Now th that is all gone, right? <laughs> I'm going to a school where, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know anybody. Nobody knows me. And so how am I going to carve right. a new, um, how do I carve my niche, right? How do I make myself known in this new environment that, that I'm entering into? So I'll, I'll kind of pause there and then I'll, mm -hmm. I'll share a little bit about my high school experience. If you have any questions or thoughts or insight. Yeah, well, I'm just, your story, like I said, I did not know. I knew parts of what you said, but definitely didn't know um, um, the day that you really decided to act out in the in the worst way. The conference president was right there, so I mean, it was like Satan tried to really set you up to where you were about to get the word, like you said, the book thrown at you. Um, and so, but, yeah, um, it's just you know, hearing what you shared so far. Um, and just knowing that when you call her Mama Murphy, Gail Murphy was there to uh, just to, um, to 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 speak out for you and to advocate for you. That's just amazing. Um, and I know that when you guys saw each other and you were preaching and she was doing the music, I know it warmed her heart in such a way, like to just see where you had come from, from cussing the principal out in front of the conference yeah. president to delivering the sermon and she's doing your appeal that's just that's amazing that's absolutely amazing but yes okay tell tell us take us take us to the next step yeah so at this point in time i realized i was always a funny guy I was always a class clown i i was semi-athletic right i played um basketball but now i'm going to a school where everybody is much more athletic everybody is much bigger faster funnier than i am right and so I had to, how do I combat that? I had to be much more, you know, you know, how do I push the boundaries in order for me to make my myself known and fit in? And so even the first few semesters that I was there, there was people trying to test me to, you know, you know, calling me white boy or, you know, you're soft. And, and so if you don't stand up for yourself, right, then you're, you're labeled as a punk. You're somebody who, so, so I always had, so I had that, I channeled that frustration, that anger into honing in and saying, okay, um, I'm not going to be disrespected at the end of the day. And I've always earned people's, um, you know, earned my classmates respect because of that, because of that. And, you know, saying I have a go lucky personality, I'm always, you know, cool and funny and, and things like that. But mm -hmm. it, it was when I was trying out for the basketball team that I couldn't make it because of my GPA. And it was at that point, I realized, you know what, I need to really focus on my academics and because if not i'm, I'm going to be a high school dropout i'm not going to be able to graduate and so i i really focused and honed in on being able to graduate high school but in my in, in that experience going there I, I i there was certain things that i didn't fully let go of so i remember fridays we used to go to the grocery store and steal a liquor bottle and we'll drink throughout the day you know and, and pour it in our little little cups and drink you know alcohol um during class and um and so my experience there was quite interesting because here it is that i was trying to do things to fit in but as i went to the school bus you know on the school bus to go to class it was normal to see somebody open up their bible and read before they went to church it, or to, went to school it was normal to hear the basketball players talk about yeah i'm going to this revival i'm going to church and it's like, yo, right. they're not Adventists, but yet they practice their faith far more greater than I do. And I know the truth. Right. Right. And right. and so it was it was that point where that seed was planted. And I didn't fully realize, like, man, this experience being at a Title I school, there are far more people who are 
expressive of their faith and hold on to their faith. And I just left an entire culture, right? A church environment where, and a school system where if you was a Christian, you was labeled as corny and a clown, right? Mm -hmm. And right. so I saw the two dynamics um, taking place. And so praise God, I did graduate um, with uh, 12 credits more than I needed and a 2.0 and, and I, I passed okay. the standardized testing. And it was at that point where where I realized there was something in me that I can push myself to do things that I never thought I could. Um, and nice. so that was always the catalyst of all of the other things that I knew that God how was going to prepare me to accomplish. But it was at that point, at this point in time, I'm graduating high school. I went to college. I wanted to pursue basketball. Again, I wanted to play semi-professionally in, 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 in Puerto Rico. But again, I went to college. It was a check at the end of each semester. So I just enough to attend, to clear and get my check. And I was repeating the same patterns. I, I, I told people all the time that I was, before Kanye West made it famous, I was a college dropout, right? I, I dropped out of three or four or five universities before actually like honing in and focusing. But it was at this point mm -hmm. where now I am trying to go out into the real world and experience what the real world has to offer. And so you find a job, you're trying to go to school, um, those old habits don't break as easily. And so all of a sudden you find yourself doing the same thing as before. All of a sudden you're drinking much more, you're, you're smoking. And now from that to the, now you're selling drugs and you're going to clubs and now you're putting yourself in these same situations where you're constantly getting into fights. And to the point where, you know, there have been multiple situations where those fights escalated to points where either I was going to get a gun and, and, and shoot somebody or times where I got pulled over in a non-registered car and the Holy Spirit tells me to get out of the car and I'm riding with illegal tags, no insurance, um, you know, with drugs and, and, and in the vehicle. And the, in this particular situation, I'll never forget, I was living in Tampa during the time and I bought a big uh, a vehicle and I just wanted to get the car. It was about a two hour drive. And uh, I was like, you know, let me get my, I took my old tag from an old vehicle, put it in the back of the car. As I was going to drive it down, a friend of mine said, hey, can you take this with you? So, you know, it was, uh, you know, weed and, and some cocaine. And I was like, all right, I'll just, I hit it in the car and I'm driving and not even I 10 see. miles into my drive, the motor blew. And so I, the motor blew, something told me, get out Where of the vehicle that? and and stand behind the the trunk of the car. So I was like, okay. So I got out the trunk of the car. Not even five minutes later, a police officer comes behind. Whoop, whoop. Uh, is everything okay? I'm like, yes, officer. My motor blew. I think it was either my motor or my tire blew. Something happened. And I called AAA. They're on their way to pick up the car. The police officer said, all right, well, you have a great day and drives off. Now, wow. in my experience, Lovani, if growing you, you up, be <laughs> right, with... yeah. You wouldn't be sitting here with me exactly. now if, if that motor had not blown. You'd have been if so he would have asked me for my license and registration, or if he would have ran the tag, if I wasn't standing there, I would not be standing before you, right? So it was those right. little moments where I knew that God's hand of protection was there. I remember getting to yeah. a flight at a club where, you know, it was a full out brawl of like 50, 60 people against like six and seven of us. And prior to coming, like there was a, a a pistol that we hid in the in the trunk of the car, and I remember going trying to retrieve it, and it's not there, and I don't know for the life of me where it was at, and I just remember saying like I just need to, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I feel, I feel like I need to advocate and defend my friends, and I don't want to leave the situation where where I'm looked at any differently, and then the next morning, all of a sudden. The gun is there and it's in the very place that I was searching, you know, the, the night before. Wow. And so it's those little things waking up, not knowing how I how did I make it home, you know, and then mm -hmm. looking at the pictures mm -hmm. night before, I'm like, I drank all of that, you know. And so God knew that the experiences that I was going through was going to was going to mold me into the person that he was going to create me to be and what I was going to be passionate about. And um, those experiences, one time I, I'll remember and I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and then I'll, I'll let you um, ask your next question. It was okay. during this time, I'll never forget, 
I got into a fight, another brawl, and it was at uh, there at Universal Studios. And I was trying to help my friend. The moments that I got in the most trouble was those times where I'm my intentions were really good. I wasn't trying to seek trouble. I just trouble found me that day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was helping out my friend because he was a big black dude, six foot four. And security kept um, kept bothering him and saying, we got reports that you was in a fight when in reality it wasn't him. It was our mutual friend who wasn't, you know, of the same uh, complexion. And it was his little brother who got into a fight and he was there helping out his friend's little brother. So I'm seeing him get agitated. I remember going up to him. I was like, hey, bro, let's go. Security saying, hey, like we're, we're investigating something. And one thing led to another. There was a, a, a brawl between security and myself and, and, and my friend. A police officer comes in. I don't know it's a police officer. He grabs me from behind. I stiffened up. I turn around. I swing. And there's a orange police department badge. And I'm like, oh, here it is. And so pepper sprayed. They dragged us. And as a result, I had to go now because that was my second time being arrested. I had to now yeah. um, go to the juvenile, um, go to the to juvenile detention center. And um, that weekend, I learned a lot. I, I realized how that system works. Um, and I re and, and it you wasn't until to, I to went to there. I realized I'm no. like, yeah, this ain't for me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. And so. But all of my friends who did either much crazier things, I saw the result of that, either death, right? Imprisonment for years on end. And so I was always wise beyond my years. And I was like, well, I may not make this decision, but I saw this person make that same choice. And this was the end result. So A plus B equals C. And so I'm just gonna not, I'm just going to avoid that. But I'll never forget there was a uh, when I stood before the judge, Judge Rodriguez, and um I was talking to my mother, having a conversation, and my mom said, I need you to plead guilty. I'm like, I don't know, mom. Like, like I, I wasn't, I know that my intentions were, were, were right, right? Like the, the outcome was bad, but my intentions of helping my friend wasn't wrong. And my dad was like, right. well, just plead no contest and let the judge decide, you know what? So I wrestled with this. And I'm seeing every single person before me, the judge giving the sentence to these young people and, you know, drug charges and harsh penalty, this down in the third. And I'm like second to last and I'm nervous as I'll get out. And it's me, my mother, my father, and I'm standing before the judge. And the judge says, you know, he's reading off the list, my academics, my arrest record, like everything. And he says, how do you plead? And I remember looking at my mom and my mom says, she nods her head. And I look at my dad and my dad is like, he's not really looking, right? And I said, N I, I plead guilty. And the judge was taken back by it because everyone up to that point was defending themselves and justifying as to mm -hmm. why they was doing. I said, I'm guilty. Right. Uh, hopefully you guys see the, the gospel parallels here, right? And so, yeah. so I'm standing before the judge I'm guilty. And he's kind of taken back. And he says, why do you plead guilty? And I told him, I said, listen, this, the outcome wasn't what I anticipated. In the same police report, he writes, the kid is not a bad kid. He just got caught up in the wrong situation, right? He, so he was reading all this. Mm -hmm. And my mother did yeah. this. I, I can't even remember. She, th that was Holy Spirit driven. She <laughs> says, your honor, before I was married, I was a Rodriguez. And if you know the Rodriguez family and she starts breaking down history of Rodriguez is and and behind you, there's a seal that says in God we trust. And I believe that at, God has appointed you as a judge, but there's an ultimate judge that in God. the right. And she's just she's doing this thing. And I'm just like, OK, I'm, mom. I don't know what's happening. Yeah. You know, so mom is doing her thing and she's looking and 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 he's like, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mrs. Richardson, my dad cries right but it's it, i know he's kind of putting on a show like i know he's hurt but it's like that you're, you're you know laying it all too thick but the the judge said this he says loami is not because of your record um because if it was up to me you'll be serving time but yeah. in me pleading guilty i even acknowledged that i said i have anger issues and i know that i need yeah. to deal with these anger issues 
And this yes. is the reason why I resulted in that. So my mom did a whole spiel. Right. He said, listen, it is because of your mother, not because of you, because of your mother, that I'm going to give you probation and I'm going to mandate mm. that you go to anger management class. And that was at that point where, whoa, okay, I admitted whoa. my guilt. Come on now, God somebody. Like good. I admitted yes, that yes, I needed yes. help. That that I realized I pinpointed the issue that was holding me back from all these years. And it was at that point, I'll never forget. And, and this is why, uh, side, side mark, right? Like the, the, the therapist mm -hmm. that I had was a, a younger Asian dude. And the way that he connected with me was through music, through hip hop. Like he used, okay. uh, and so he spoke my language and I was like, and through that I was able to open up and I'll never forget, I was in math class and uh, one of the counselors came and was like, um, Luami Richardson needs to go to anger management. <laughs> And he looks and it was a football coach. He's like, he has anger issues. And so because I was I was I was a light-skinned, goofy guy in the class. But right, it was at that right, point right. where, oh, okay. But it was at that moment where I realized I cannot go down this trajectory because this is where right. it's going to lead me. And it was at that moment, my mom advocating for me and going through that experience that I said, you know, anything that I do past 18 after 18 is going to stick with me for the rest of my life. So even though it wasn't a full conversion, it was a it was a shift that took place where I'm like, it yeah, was, you you needed beginning. to get it together. And I take that right. back. I said it was the beginning. It was actually not the beginning. God was planting seeds all throughout the way. And you know, now I think about the shirt I'm wearing. It's like even before what the I mean, God always makes a way. He is the way maker. He was working on that judge, but he was working and blowing the engine up. And all the other different things, even in the messed up situation with you losing your temper at the principal in front of the uh, conference president, that was still God making a way. Everything that happened still was going to lead up to what happened with that judge. And even though, like you just said, it wasn't the full conversion, it was, you knew it was God. Like you were starting you, to You got cut off. The mic cut off. There we go. I'm, you're, you're good okay. now. You're good you can hear now. me now? Okay. So you, you were starting yeah. to have, uh, even like you, I, was, I don't know if you heard this part, but um, up in, with, with what the judge did, it was, you said it wasn't the full conversion yet, but you were starting to have a new perspective about the character of God and the mercy of God. And that was starting, all of these things right. were starting to soften so, your heart. Right. And so at that point, you know, fast forward, I'm preaching evangelistic series or the book of revelation and intercession. And those moments is help me understand, well, if a man can do this, how much more Jesus our advocate is going to, you know, advocate for us. Right. But there's a part to play. Mm -hmm. So at that point, 18 years old, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm entered into the workforce again. I wanted to go play basketball, pursue it. I went back to Puerto Rico. I did make, uh, there was 500 even invite, invites i made the top 50. um i played semi-professionally for about a month and i realized i'm good prior to that i quit a job that at that time i was making close to fifty thousand dollars this is 11 12 13 years ago so for me yeah, with no was, degree making fifty thousand dollars a year that was a great money right pretty, yeah. but i quit yeah. it because i wanted to pursue something and and i knew i could do it and i did it and i was like well that was that was good enough for me i never tried to make a career out of it so I was always driven. I just didn't know what was, what the thing that I was looking to pursue, right? So I was like, well, fame and money, that's that's what I need to get um, because those things correspond. And so I worked, I, I you know, went to different venues, adventures, and uh, remember getting an opportunity to actually be on a reality TV show. And uh, when I got interviewed for the TV show, the guy that was interviewing me for this, reality tv show was adventist and uh anyway that was so it was always these moments where god is just like he's he's showing himself in some capacity long story short i turned down the opportunity to be on this reality show because i wanted to pursue um the opportunity that a manager was giving me to run a a, a fitness facility that was helping um young kids with obesity combat that mm -hmm. and unfortunately it didn't work out but throughout this time i did not I wasn't going to clubs. Instead, I was going to bars, right? Instead of drinking 
to pass out. I am drinking to enjoy myself, right? So it was modified. It was never this full transformation mm -hmm. um, throughout my adulthood. And so there was always this yearning for love. There's always this yearning for acceptance. And, um, and I remember working as a fitness instructor and I met this young lady and as I got to know her was head over heels over her and, mm -hmm. um, got to know each other and to make that story even shorter, like I experienced a heartbreak that really got me to a point where I was so lost and broken that the one thing that was a positive in my life was now taken away that it left me questioning questioning and going back to that question like who am i like like what is it out of life that i'm wanting to achieve and to take um or, or to or to get and so prior to that heartbreak it was just a lot of chaos happening like i, I remember living with my roommates and there was this constant stress uh the stress of making sure rent is paid a gas bill being cut off cable bill being cut off car constantly breaking down like everything that i was pouring myself into it just seemed to fall apart and then finally i find something that is that that is a uh that man okay the the one the the, the prize possession you could say that even though everything right is going wrong in my life this 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 woman is the thing that completes me and then now i'm heartbroken by this person um and and the way that the the breakup took place was just a reminder of how it was when i was a teenager a middle schooler with my mother and you know and so that i'm looking back at it now understanding that it was a, a an abandonment wound that i did not know that i that i realized that it really broke me to the point where the only thing that I could do was try to see and try to make sense out of life. And throughout this time in this journey, my mother, my sister, and my family and church family was always constantly praying for Loami. Um, and at that point, I believe that God was hearing the prayers and he was really pouring into me at that point in time where everything I was pouring my energy and my focus on was falling apart, whether it be in business, whether it be uh, fame, whether it be in money, whether it be in relationships, those things were taken away. And now I was left with me and having to deal with what it is that I want out of life. And that's when my sister told me about a conference uh, called GYC. And, um, and it was at that point that I was like, okay, maybe I will start the new year with God. Maybe I will start you know, making him a priority and, and just seeking him. And throughout this time, I've always prayed, but it was those half-hearted prayers. God did me out the situation. If you take me out, I will bless you with my life. Then he does. And then I'm right back to doing what I was doing. But this one was different. And my, the way that my sister pivoted and said it was there was a donor or a sponsor for you to go to this youth conference. You know, fast forwarding, found that it was my mother who did it. But I was like, okay, out of respect for this person who sponsored me to go, I will go. And, you know, then okay. I'll transition into to the next part. Yeah, so you heard about GYC. And, um, and just to back up before we, we, we get into that piece of it, though, you know, everything that you thought was going to make you happy, the young lady, the, even the potential of being on a reality TV show, making the money for at that time was a good amount of money and you did all of that and it still that did not make you happy it did not fulfill you um and so now you've been introduced to well you're 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 going to gyc what happened there yeah so um during the time frame um the church oh they got a sponsored bus and i'll never forget as i'm walking and packing up my stuff to go to this youth conference um <laughs> i come across and there's a bunch of young people like younger people like 13 14 15 year olds right and i'm a little older um than everyone else at that point and i remember walking and i'm just like you know i'm just looking forward to this weekend and just i'm just gonna i'm just gonna take it all in i wasn't really expecting much i just knew i had a lot of questions 
that I was seeking answers and I could not find answers to those questions. And uh, I'll never forget my, my buddy of mine. He was like, yo, what's good? I was like, hey, what's going on, man? And, and he was telling me that, uh, yeah, man, you're going to this youth conference. And I was like, uh, yeah, man, I, I'm just going to start the new year off, you know, something different. I wanted to travel a little bit during that time. And um, he was like, yeah, good luck. I heard it's a kid's conference, like a little kitty conference. I'm like, oh, word? I'm like, well, he's like, yeah, my, nep my nieces and nephews are going. And I'm seeing the nieces and nephews. So I'm like, oh, that, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to that. So, oh, mm -hmm. I, I'm, as I'm getting my bags and I'm like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to go. Um, Maurice, um, who, God bless his heart, was there, Maurice Graham. And he said, bro, like, I haven't seen him in years. And he was always yeah. kind of like a, a stabilizer for our for our youth group where mm -hmm. basketball was the thing that we all loved growing up playing basketball in yeah. church leagues. And even when we went to do our own thing, Maurice was the one person who always found a different way for us. Hey, we're going to go to, you know, to the club. He's like, actually, man, let's go. Let's go to midnight basketball. We're like, all right, yeah, let's go. Hoop. And he will always do this thing where he will gravitate the group to make better decisions and better choices. That's why I remember seeing Maurice there. And he's like, bro, like you're going to GYC. He's like, man. And he's telling me everything about the conference. And I said, yeah, man. He's like, man, I don't think you understand what you're getting yourself into. Or, and, and, and I'll never forget him saying that. And that was a seed planted. Mm -hmm. And I just remember getting on that bus. I had my fitted hat. I still wear my snapbacks to this day, but I had my fitted hat. <laughs> I had my jacket, I had the big clothes on and I'm, and I'm going to, this conference. And as soon as I get off the bus, it's a bunch of people that are just weird, Atante. They're weird because it's <laughs> happy Sabbath, brother, blessings, brother, Maranatha, <laughs> and all of these things that, you know, Adventists tend to say, but there were young mm -hmm. people, right? They're young adults who are, who right. are, and, and I'm seeing this passion with them and, and this zealousness for something more than it themselves. Was... I can see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I'm the guy with the big fit, you that, know, with the, that was with the really big weird jacket. To you. Like, I would say that had to have been really weird to you. You were like coming from a whole totally different space. And so it, I'm sure it right. kind of shocked your system. Like, and like what you said to you, it was very weird. Absolutely. And I'm looking at them like y'all are the weird ones, right? Like I'm, I'm, I know who I, like, I'm cool. Like I know who I am. Y'all are weird. And I'll never forget. Um, it was, I never wake up early for nothing during this time. And it was Sebastian Braxton oh, morning devotions okay. that I drew me in. Early yeah. So oh, praise God. Yeah. So the early meetings and he's, and he's sharing. So this is why it's full circle being able to see the people that, that helped you in that conversion process to being, mm -hmm. working with them and, and developing friendships with them and, and being able to work together for a greater good. And so Sebastian is yeah. preaching and I'm like, I'm hearing his testimony of Tante. I'm like, this yeah. brother is willing to die for the very message I grew up believing. Like, I'm not even right. willing to die for the life that I am living, right? I, I saw right. friends die. I saw uh, 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 girlfriends of mine, not my girlfriends, but like, you know, friends, uh, girlfriends who, who got pregnant, not knowing who the father of their child is and just chaos mm -hmm. on this end. But I grew up a good Seventh Day Adventist boy with, you know, what I'm saying that grew up with morning devotions and going to a, a, a academy, and here it is that he's mm -hmm. willing to, and he's preaching it with passion. He's preaching it with, and he's being unapologetically himself. He was mentioning like he had all these pairs of Jordans. I'm like, okay, so he connects, he relates, and so that seed was planted. And I'll never forget that it was eleven, <laughs> the the moment where where it was eleven o'clock service, and during that time. Um, my family and I will always sit in the front. We always wanted to get good seats. And uh, the right. night before, uh, got in contact with uh, I met a, mute, uh, a friend of mine. I was striking conversation. And the next morning, I saw her and I was like, oh, okay, well, I don't want to sit next to her and make it obvious, right? So I'm going to go sit on this end, mm -hmm. kind of play it off and look, and that she'll invite me to sit with her and this whole thing. And none of that worked out because as soon as the conference started, I turned around, she's gone, but all the seats are taking. And I'm sitting there at the seat. And I'm just like, well, I don't want to get get up and leave. And Mark Finley comes and he preaches a, a, a Sabbath morning when God's um, God's passion becomes our passion, right? And he's talking about mm. the story of Daniel, and he's making all of these points where every question that I had, he points and he's like, and there's no mistake out of the million of people he called you, 
and, and me like he's pointing at me right and and it's mm -hmm. it, i i want to stop there and fast forward that i went to a conference that he's he's sharing what he does before he preaches at a church or any conference he'll go on the mm -hmm. stage and he'll pray and god would tell him there's a couple over here there's a young person over here mm -hmm. whoever i want you to focus your attention in these areas and i want you to deliver these points backtracking right. he's doing that very thing and he's looking at me as i'm, I'm in my mind and he's looking at me and yeah i'm in the front row and i'm sitting here like you know what am i doing it's no mistake that you're here oh okay mm. right and he makes an appeal and i don't know if you remember the, those the, those cartoons where psh, the devil will be here psh, and the little angel will be here and they're talking yeah, to yeah, you yeah, 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 and yeah. i'll never forget i was yeah, experiencing yeah, the, that where yeah, yeah like great controversy going on <laughs> the great controversy i didn't know what the great mm -hmm. controversy was i just know little right. angel bad angel right little little my little yeah. voices and <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm getting text messages of Tante like, yo, where we at? We turning up. And I'm like, you know, parties and, and, and like, bro. So this, uh, prior to that was, uh, me interviewing to be on that reality show. So like, bro, this year's going to be lit. Like, where you at? And the other was, you got to give, like, you got to give your heart to God. Like, do you, wow, do you want yes. to continue this path of brokenness? And, and this thing was so real that he makes the appeal mm. and he makes an appeal for those who work within the church administrators whoever to say a special prayer for them and i'm sitting there mm. listening to this sermon and i'm i'm feeling this tug like i've never felt it before like my heart wants to rip out of my chest because of this decision i need to make mm. and i'll never forget there's a flood of people and as i'm walking the the crowd splits i see my sister and then all of a sudden the crowd gathers together and i see her and i break down crying because i remember all the times that she's praying my mother praying and yeah. this bless their hearts these two ladies uh black ladies were next to me i'm crying i'm bawling i'm like i, I can't control myself and mm. and she's they're rubbing and I'm, I'm rubbing my shoulder and i can't talk and they're just praying for me like you know so at that point I remember at the end of that conference, I talked to Sebastian and I asked him, I was like, bro, I know what I experienced here is real and I'm afraid to go back home because I mm. don't want to go through what I went through. Like this moment here back. was too real for me that I experienced God's love and mercy and compassion in a way that I've never seen it before. And um, he, we'll joke around, there was a video of me like crying with my fitted hat trying to be hard, but like, I'm, I'm broken. And so, so I, I want to stop there. No, actually I'll finish off because th th there is a part two to this, to this ending that it was at that point that I told God, I, I, if, if, if this is real, then I need to get away from home as far as possible. Mm -hmm. And I went back home. Yeah. I try to go back to work. I'm trying to, well, I won't drink to get drunk. I'll just drink casually. And God told me it's either all or nothing. Like you can't, Yes. you can't teeter with this decision and um right. i said all right i got a opportunity found out that it was my mother who paid for me to go to that gyc conference um during that time i went to a bible college uh four-month evangelism school like what you see of afco and, and arise and yeah. there in orlando and from there i had the opportunity to go to asi youth for jesus and you know be a bible worker coordinator get to meet you know saying you guys and yeah, even in that yeah. moment where I was on 3ABN, this is how God works all things together for good, mm -hmm. where uh, Dean Pride, he was the Dean at Forest Lake during that time, sees me on 3ABN. He reaches out to me, he's oh, like, he bro, remembers. is that you on stage? He, was, I was, he, he remembers, remembered. He remembers you. He said, yeah. <laughs> he said, he messaged, I was like, is that you on stage? I was he's like, there is a God. And he was deaning at Southern <laughs> Adventist Academy, uh, University. So I, I want to yeah. share this part because I go back and I'm I'm sharing my testimony or little devotional at Southern, and he asked a question: How many of us? How many of y'all graduated from Forest Lake? Everyone's like, "Woo!" He was like, "Yeah, he's the reason why you have ID badges and and uniforms." I'm like, oh, "Me? Like like because of <laughs> how I constantly put the rules? They changed everything." Yeah. He's like, "You know." So I was like, "Man, I can make an impact." It was for the negative, but nonetheless, I did make an impact. 
But it was at that <laughs> point where God opened up the door for me to be a chaplain, a Bible worker, working for ASI and and yeah. and and being able to work with young people in the mm -hmm. in that church context. And for the last 10, 12 years of that ministry of that time frame, you know, I was able to God was restoring me and giving me my identity, giving me my purpose, understanding what it is that I needed to like the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the experiences that I went through was not going to go in vain. He was going to use it for a greater good. And, you know, to right. be able to travel the world, to be an evangelist, to be able to baptize young people and, and mm -hmm. find my identity in God, it was a full circle moment. And I'm going to pause there because there is a second part that I want to share and we can conclude you know, from that aspect, but that was the journey of my conversion. And then what God did for me, yeah. you know what I'm saying? After GYC for about 10, 12 years where I was in full-time work and um, working, but even during the time of ministry, mm -hmm. there was still something more that God needed me to go through. There was still something more that God wanted me to yeah. teach me because as of much course, as yeah. I thought I was healed, there was still things that he says, mm -hmm. no, you're, you're not fully equipped. Right. And I'm gonna get to let you go to this experience, but that was the, that was a journey post GYC. Yes, that is. Well, praise God for what He's done in your life, and it's so powerful to have known you all these years and still never. And I'm sure I still don't know. And and none of us are gonna know completely the whole story because I'm gonna plug the book here in just a second. They, there's a book. Luami has written a yeah. book on his on his story, and it will give you more detail, and you can be able to 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 read it and then share it with. Uh, whoever, not just young people, it's a blessing to all age people, but definitely can use it to share. But praise God for for what he for what he he did and how he was always being a way maker in every situation, in every situation. Praise God for your mom. Um, that just tells you because yeah. we're all, again, I'm talking to parents. We're all parents, and two th two things can be true at the same time, right? We could be praying parents and not always obviously perfect parents. None of us are perfect. We all make mistakes, but we could still be praying for our children and God will still answer and honor those prayers. Um, and she was a bold woman. She was a bold woman to have stood yeah. to profess her faith in God to a judge and to be an advocate for her son. I mean, that was just, that was beautiful and praise God for that. But um, I just want to say this, the story is amazing. And, and you're doing amazing things. And somebody said, oh, I remember Luwami from Salt. So you have some, some Florida yes, Orlando people here. I was going to talk about here. that here in a second. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, Go yeah. What's up? <laughs> so I'll, I'll conclude with that part. You know, my mother, okay. both my parents passed away, but they passed when I was yeah. um, after my conversion. And so my, mother, my mom did get to see our family come back to the fold. And I'll never forget the Praise last God. conversation that I had that I had a lot of questions and um, I didn't want to see my mother. She, she suffered with uh, colon cancer and um, mm. and I saw my the version of my mother not be the same version. And I struggled with wanting to see her. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. you know, a, a good friend of mine uh, actually it was Lance who um, who told me, he's like, you, you need to go see your mother. And so I went and um, I, I remember on that plane um, feeling guilt feeling shame, feeling hurt, feeling like how disappointing I I made my mother, you know, and the hell that she had to go through. And so I want to, I'm sharing this part because there have been countless parents who at times tries to put the responsibility of speakers like myself and pastors to save their children. Mm. When mm. the one thing that I want to tell parents is be consistent mm. in your faith walk like be transparent yeah. and honest and vulnerable because that's going to yes. go further than anything that I had to say. Right. And so I remember yeah. seeing my mother and she had this look of like my son. Now understand oh. that I'm feeling ashamed. I'm feeling like the worst person in the world. And she said, right. I remember she sees me at GYC and she said, who told you, you know, uh, I, I kind of fast forward, but but I do want to share this, like GYC, five years later, I got to share my testimony in the very city that I did all my dirt, got arrested, in partying, Orlando. was okay. able to share my testimony at the very conference in Orlando Amen. in front of thousands of people, right? And my mom sees this moment, Amen. and the first thing she sees is, mm. 
who Crazy who helped bad. you combine your shirt and tie? You look good because she always believed in my heart that I was going to be a preacher. I was going to be an evangelist. Aww, I was going to be a, and I was like, and I re, I rebutted it against that. I rebutted against that. Yeah. And every time my mom did it, I'm like, all right, cool. I'm going to be more rebellious to that calling. Right. And so yeah. I see my mom on her deathbed and I just never forget. She mm -hmm. said, um, you know, I, I went to go see her and she's experiencing this pain. And I, I remember talking to God. I'm just like, God, like, like she's yours. And I've learned what it meant to surrender yeah. and, and saying, yeah. okay, having that conversation with my mom, she said, Loami, I know I'll see the family, you know, saying the tree of life. And just remember mm -hmm. at the end of the day, regardless of the, of the highs and the lows, it's faith. It's all about faith. Just put your faith in God. Yes. And it gave me so much closer to know that oh, praise God. this young boy now has to become a man into his new walk with God. Like I don't have nobody who's going to be praying constantly. Now that prayer has to be lived out. And I have to have my own faith in God and my own prayer life with God to really live out this fulfillment in my life. And so mm. it, it's been a great journey. Um, all of those experiences mm. led me to have a passion and a desire to help and impact the community. In 2020, you know, I, I worked for SALT and seeing how a, mm -hmm. a uh, a ministry started by Eric because of his experience of holiness is now a full on uh, a ministry that is impacting oh, the yeah. city of Orlando, where even the mayor of Orlando has acknowledged the work. And we're seeing Isaiah 58 taking place to see yes, a young yes. Adventist who left the church be re engage in the church because of a, a mission greater than themselves and being rebaptized. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm always grateful for the opportunity to be a part of that. And, and to know, mm -hmm. okay, we can make an impact outside of the four walls of a church to, yes. okay, all of a sudden now I'm, I'm working in, 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 in 2020 shifted. And, and as you know, the whole George Floyd situation transpired. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I remember the, this, this, this anger in me, but it was good anger, justice anger, where mm -hmm. I'm like, I, I saw our brethren, our friends, people that I worked in ministry how they responded to that. And Atante, I want to share this. And, and if we go a little longer, my apologies, but I want to share this because it's okay. I was George Floyd. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like that was me. Mm. If, if, yeah. if you cast him away, like then what mm. do you think of me? Because I know mm. the experiences that I had. And if it wasn't for God's grace, I wouldn't be mm. here. And if you would have met mm -hmm. me 15 years ago, you would see me the same person. So this right. is where I was like, you know what? There has to be something greater than what we have been preaching and doing as a church where the mm -hmm. message has to now go from, from in intellectual understanding to a heart conversion where all of a right. sudden I'm working for salt. And guess what? I'm back in the very inner cities where my, <laughs> you know, where, where I went to high school is, uh, right. where, where I went to high school, mm -hmm. meeting those young people. Uh, having the opportunity to be in education and just pouring into low income students. Now I have a story that can relate with them. They know because mm -hmm. of my past story, I'm just not making something up. They see my walk with right. God. They see me struggling mm -hmm. through my faith and the actions that come behind that, but being true to who God created me to be and knowing that mm -hmm. one thing that Loami is always going to hang his hat on is that he's going to, he's a real dude. Like, like what you see is what you get. They ain't no, sh there's mm -hmm. no, there's no fake with me when it comes to this stuff. So yeah. working for salt, being able to start a, um, uh, uh, a nonprofit to help inner city kids give the opportunity for entrepreneurship for, to go back to mm -hmm. school at HBCUs, to become an academic mm -hmm. advisor, right. At a, yeah. at, at Oakwood Academy and, and pouring into those very students who came out of those communities where the college dropout, come on, oh, somebody University. listen to this. The college dropout is now, Right, Oakwood University, like the college yeah, dropout yeah, is now academy, helping kids stay university. into school. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So academic yes. advisor is now helping students stay into school who are first generation mm -hmm. college graduates. I'm the first in my family right. to graduate with a college degree and, and a semester away from right. finishing my master's. And it's all tied into my experience, right? To Praise be able God. to write a book where the standardized test, the kid who, who failed standardized testing wrote a book, right? And, yes, and, and so yes. God, everything that, everything that the world defines you to be, oh, you're a published author. Oh, you're this, those things came after 
I was rooted in knowing who I was in God and what he created me to be, to allow those testimonies and those stories to never forget it. And I'll never forget mm -hmm. where I look back at that G GYC situation. And I remember in my appeal, I'm telling them, I was like, regardless of where life will take you, come back to this moment and remember this mm -hmm. moment. And those, yeah. those days where I feel like giving up, I'll never forget. I just got a call a few weeks ago from a good friend about a mutual friend who suffered a stroke and is going through a lot. And uh, we did a lot of things in the past where we hustled together. I'll keep it at that. But Atante, he said these things. He said these words. He asked me a question during my time where I was at the evangelism school. And he asked me, like, Lo, what made you make the decision to follow God, right? Because you've done this before and then things go back to normal and I'm, and I'm preaching to him. And he's like, bro, I don't want to hear the preaching, right? This is, this is me. You're mm -hmm. talking to like, be straight up with me. So I'm talking to him and I said, bro, to be quite honest, I don't know what allowed me to experience what I experienced. I just know I had a bunch of questions and those questions were answered after that conference. And he told me these words, he said, "Lo, I'm proud of you and just know that at any point you decide to come back and do the things that we were doing, man, we'll welcome you with open arms, with open arms. But just know that your testimony to God is dead. And I don't ever want to hear anything about God. Mm. My experience and the journey that I went through and the reason why I continue to push forward, even when church members have tried to destroy my ministry in my name, in those moments mm -hmm. where... I felt alone and abandoned in those moments where opportunities weren't given to me because I wasn't educated or I was too urban or, or I, I didn't fit the click or because my passion for this, you know, this type of work or the type of music I listened to didn't fit the mold. Mm -hmm. He said those words. And in those moments where I feel like giving up on Christianity, not even Christianity, just mm -hmm. the church and this whole thing. Right. I right. said, that walk is not for me. It's for him. It's for mm. those who have seen the journey where how can right. I, with everything that I've experienced, everything that I've mm -hmm. been able to accomplish, I can't go back, right? As Peter said, mm -hmm. he says, where am I going to go? You have the words of life. So the only option I have now is to push forward. And by God's yeah. grace, those issues of abandonment, those issues of, of value and identity and self-worth and not knowing what I was created to do and and my skills and my gifts and my talents, how do I utilize that? God throughout mm -hmm. the, since the pandemic has really been restoring me mm -hmm. to somebody new where the th the desires of my heart is simply his desires, right? Where I'm like, God, I need this. Mm -hmm. He provides it, not because I deserve it or because I've earned it, but because I'm more, far more appreciative and I know that I want to utilize this for his glory. So to be able to work for salt, to be able to um, um, start my nonprofit, to be able to travel around the world and, and, and go back to education where I failed and God is now using me to restore, right? Not only myself to, but to heal those moments of brokenness, to even getting calls from churches and conferences that negated me because of my look, but now are reaching out because we need someone exactly like you to fulfill this. And I'm just right. like, God, you got a sense of humor, man, to even live yes. manna where I don't understand people understand that in 2020, I got the call to go to, to, uh, to Tennessee, to Tennessee, to work at a charter school. And mm -hmm. again, went through a breakup, went through a heartbreak and three months into that job, I completely lost all of my savings, lost all of my money, like, mm -hmm. like depressed, um, got a call from right. a church, from a conference, got the job two days later, rekented on the job, told me that I'll never work for this conference uh, again, not knowing why it was, but how, how, how funny is that, that God, the very college or the high school that I got kicked out of 10 years later, I'm, I'm called back to be a chaplain for the assistant for the varsity team of the basketball team. So everything that oh, I wow. lost, God restored in mm -hmm. some different capacity. And so I tell God people restores. like, listen, dude, your test is simply a testimony. Your, your, your mm -hmm. mistakes are stepping stones to your success, which led to the series, the struggle is real to understand the gospel. And I can go on and on yes. and on, but now even living manna being a place where 
at that point I was so broken and I did not mm -hmm. want to do anything with church. And I was like, if I never mm. preach again, God, I am completely at peace with it. If I never enter mm. into a church and boom, pandemic hits, there's an online community that pours that I see real genuine yes. love. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm yes. getting asked to speak far more now than I've ever had in, in my time before. Right. And I'm seeing that my messages are, I have nothing to lose, Atante, and I'll, I'll conclude with this. I have nothing yeah. to lose. But in the moments, right. in the it, the way that I preach, I know I have nothing to lose. I'm seeing how everything is being gained. And I'm seeing how yes. it's not just me. There are so many people going through brokenness, mm -hmm. going through identity per, uh, identity crisis, mm -hmm. not knowing what their purpose is, not knowing what they're created to be. Um, um, for, and, and even the mental health journey where I see now why God allowed mm -hmm. me to go through this. And it's for this reason and for this moment alone. And so I'm, I'm excited. Mm -hmm for where the Lord is, is leading me. And, um, I'm ready for this new season of my life that he's preparing me to, yes. to enter into. But this is why it's so God important when we talk about, when we talk about the theme of the great controversy and Bible mm -hmm. prophecy, the, the, the very center of the great mm -hmm. controversy is two things, Atante, the word of their testimony and by the blood of the lamb, the that is it. Lamb. Yes, so if you if it. you're going to preach about the gospel, you better have a testimony of what God has done and be very uh, honest and yes. transparent about what God has done and what he is doing. Yeah. So people can see the mm -hmm. evidence of what you're saying is not just an intellectual uh, uh, a right. study, but a transformative one. And so now because that mm -hmm. and even today I'm looking and I'm like, I'm sh I'm sharing things and I'm just like, this is the gospel. God has let me it allow me to go through see the lens of the gospel. In, in a way where I'm just like, I know who I am. I know what he's creating mm -hmm. me to be. And there's nothing stopping mm -hmm. me, regardless of what people say, what doors close. The the doors that man closed, God, God opened you. up years later for me to enter. The, the, he has me. He has me. So God that is has, my story. He has you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And wow, I, I, such a blessing. Known you all these years. And I'm just finally getting the whole picture. So just... <laughs> Praise God. It was a blessing. I know it was a blessing to everyone who's viewing and it was a blessing to me. And if, you know, I just want people to know, want them to know, look, if you liked what you heard, which I know you did, and you want to hear more um, from Loami, you can definitely tune in on Thursday evenings here on Living Man at Church. The struggle is real. Have that program. It starts at 7 p.m. Central Time. Am I right about that time? 8, 8, 8 p.m. Central Time. 8 p.m. I thought it okay. 8, 8, 8 p.m. Central time. time. 8 p.m. Central Time. And I'll teach you how to sign up to get alerts just in case you forget. And if you want to read this story that you just heard and have more in-depth information in there to hear how what God has done in Loami's life, and then you can even read it and, and, and share it with a young person, I want to um, show you how um, you can get his book. I am is greater than I was. That is the name of his book. And you can get that on Amazon. Just put that title into uh, the search box or put Luami Richardson. I'm sure that will work too. That'll come up. And you that's how you can get his book um, and to read about this powerful testimony, what God has done in his life. And it's just so encouraging to hear Again, when I chose, I'm going back to my t-shirt. When I chose this t-shirt this morning, um, <laughs> I was thinking of myself. I wasn't necessarily thinking of your testimony, but I'm seeing now how just God was always making a way for you, Loami. He was always there with you and he's still with you. And there's still even greater things um, to come. And it's just such a blessing to hear how God has not just delivered you out of situations, but also healing your heart healing that anger issue, mm. healing the, the abandonment uh, wound that you were feeling for so long in certain areas and, and all of those things. He's just done amazing work in your life and we all just praise God. Uh, and it's just a blessing to hear. So praise God, praise God and what praise he's continuing God. to do praise in your God. life. Praise God, praise God. 
Yes, I just want to invite everyone to, to pray with me as we, as we close out this segment of our church service today. But I don't want you to go away. After prayer, you're, there's, we're going to go into the divine worship service, and there's so much more blessings to come. Uh, so you don't want to miss Pastor Meyer's sermon either. Uh, but just want to thank everyone for tuning in and to, and to tune in to hear this powerful testimony. Join me as we just praise God for his goodness. God, we are just so just amazed at what you do and what you can do and, and working in our lives and saving our life. And you're always making a way. Even somebody put it in the chat. They said uh, in those messed up situations are the God of the zigzag, the God of the zigzag. That's what they put. And that's what Luami's story is like. It's just showing you that you are the God of the zigzag. So even when it looked like things were bad, so down and bad, you were using all of these situations just to bring him up so you will be glorified and to show him and everyone who knew him that you, you were working in his life and you're still working in his life. So Lord, we pray over Luami and, and the ministry that he continues to do, that you will continue to guide and lead him. And we just ask that you continue to be with us as we continue to worship you um, and on this day, your Sabbath, as we go into the divine worship service. We praise, praise you, God, and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> 